Welcome to uh, Online Commerce Forum for Easter Sunday. I'm going to begin with um, the um, UN Security uh, Council. And of course, the, I think, important, although I'm not uh, banking on it, but nonetheless important uh, vote, um, not least because of a uh, US uh, abstention. Um, this is the first time that we've seen uh, the US take at least a step away uh, from Israel uh, diplomatically um, since the sort of Gaza war uh, broke out with um, October the 7th. Um, of course, we have no faith um, in this resolution. Uh, it's not a binding resolution. There's no threat um, involved. Um, and indeed, my understanding is uh, that the resolution calls for a ceasefire over Ramadan, and uh, that comes to an end. I think it's got something to do with the moon and seeing the moon, um, April the 9th or 10th, so uh, not long. Um, and also, of course, it calls for the release of the so-called um, hostages uh, taken mainly uh, by Hamas, but not only Hamas on October uh, the 7th. Um, OK, so if we look at um, uh, this this vote and uh, the US abstention, we know Israel's uh, response, and that is, first of all, Netanyahu cancelled a high level um, delegation visiting uh, Washington. Um, of course, that uh, visit um, might have been cancelled, but almost as soon as it was cancelled, they're negotiating um, when there is going to be um, such a meeting. So this is very much a gesture, uh, one would have thought, in terms of internal um, Israeli uh, politics. Um, but also, of course, um, we have um, at the same time as the United States uh, abstaining, uh, we have continued deliveries of um, US um, arms. And um, my understanding is that either they're there or they're just about to go there. We have the delivery of 25 F. Uh, 35 fighters. These are the most advanced uh, fighter aircraft in the world. They're fifth generation stealth um, fighter uh, bombers. Um, and we also have um, US deliveries of uh, 2000 pound bombs. Um, I don't know whether they count as um, bunker busters, but they are of that sort of order. Um, you drop them and they leave a huge uh, crater, as well as the sort of standard 500 pound uh, bombs. Now we're reassured uh, that um, or orders for such um, artillery, um, uh, shells and, um, and bombs and planes um, happen way in the past. And uh, that's undoubtedly uh, true. Nonetheless, if the United States really wanted to send uh, a message uh, to Israel, uh, it would cut off uh, arms supplies. And certainly when it comes to sophisticated um, fighter aircraft such as F-35s, um, my understanding is that for each hour uh, such planes fly in the sky, uh, they require something along the order of 10 hours uh, maintenance uh, to make sure that they can go up again uh, safely. And so that means replacing widgets, uh, but also engines um, on a regular uh, basis. So the United States could switch the tap off, uh, but clearly it's chosen not to. This isn't because of some sort of legally binding contract. Uh, this is a political uh, decision. So the United States has made a political decision 
uh, to uh, engage in gesture politics. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the war can continue uh, with the uh, US uh, supplies uh, going uninterrupted. Uh, um, what we do know is that the assault, uh, the promised assault on Rafa um, has been delayed. There's talk of it being delayed until May. Um, I don't know whether that's uh, the result of um, US uh, pressure, uh, but I wouldn't rule that one uh, out. Nonetheless, Netanyahu says that uh, um, Israel is going to press on uh, to total victory uh, with or without uh, the United States. I have to say myself uh, that uh, because we're not actually dealing with uh, a high-tech uh, opponent, uh, because we're dealing with um, Hamas, uh, a guerrilla uh, force, uh, that is indeed uh, within Israel's uh, power uh, to do if you take it uh, as, for example, a defeating um, you know, what we're told is uh, four uh, battalions of Hamas fighters uh, in Rafah. There's no doubt that Israel uh, can uh, beat them, uh, can uh, kill uh, most of those uh, fighters. Does that mean, though, that Israel would see a total victory? Uh, does that mean that Hamas would suffer a total defeat? Well, clearly not, uh, because Hamas isn't simply a military force, it's, it's fundamentally and mainly a political force. It's the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, with uh, deep historic roots and with uh, deep um, social uh, uh, support and not only deep social support uh, in Gaza, um, but also um, on uh, the West Bank. And if you look, for example, for what it's worth, and I'm not, you know, putting too much uh, weight on this, but if you look at the um, opinion polls uh, that have been conducted under, obviously, in Gaza, under impossible uh, conditions, what they show is uh, support for Hamas uh, in the 40 something uh, percentages, but also support uh, for Hamas on the West Bank in similar uh, percentages. And what they also show is that support for the Palestinian Authority, uh, for Fatah, uh, that certainly isn't in the 40%, uh, but it's somewhere around the 4 or 5%. Uh, uh, so clearly in terms of the leading uh, political force uh, in terms of popular support Hamas um, is the organization not not majority support but clearly the biggest uh, political uh, party so that isn't uh, going to be destroyed because uh, Israel achieves total military uh, uh, victory uh, in Gaza which could easily and uh, I don't know what's going to happen uh, could easily see the ethnic cleansing of the whole uh, of um, that piece of territory by forcing people uh, over the border um, into Egypt, into e Egyptian Sinai, and then basically saying, well, it's now an Egyptian uh, problem. Um, but of course, Egypt doesn't want that problem, not simply because uh, what we're talking about when it comes to Gaza is well over two million uh, uh, people, um, what would we what we'd be talking about uh, is a political nightmare as far as Egypt uh, would be concerned, i.e. would they maintain their peace treaty uh, with Israel? Wouldn't those uh, two million people continue to resist uh, Israel? You ask the question and you know the answer. Of course, they would continue uh, to resist uh, Israel. They would be launching rockets, not uh, from uh, um, uh, the Gaza Strip, that's true, uh, but nonetheless, if they had the opportunity, they would be launching missiles from Sinai. How does Israel respond uh, under those conditions? One presumes uh, by bombing uh, Sinai, perhaps by invading uh, the Sinai. Uh, who knows? 
Either way, uh, I think when it comes to an explanation of uh, why uh, the United States abstained uh, on the U UN Security Council, it's a combination um, of strategic concerns uh, for its allies in the Middle East, uh, for, you know, for their stability, not simply uh, because, um, you know, amongst average uh, people in Egypt, um, Jordan, um, Syria, uh, the Lebanon, uh, Israel is deeply hated and there will be a profound sympathy and solidarity uh, for the Palestinians. But that feeling uh, will also uh, find its uh, um, echo uh, in the officer class, uh, certainly amongst junior uh, officers who fancy uh, that it's their opportunity uh, to get rid of uh, Sisi uh, or to get rid of the king uh, in Jordan or to get rid of uh, the crown prince uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and one can carry on uh, uh, down the list. But the other consideration, I think, uh, again, I'm not based in America, so I'm picking these things up very much second hand. Uh, but I also think that in an election year, uh, Biden uh, is under pressure and not just under pressure uh, from uh, people um, who've come um, immediately um, from the Middle East or Palestine uh, in their own lifetime, but from uh, the sons and daughters uh, of people that have come from Palestine uh, or the Middle East. And it goes beyond that. So I was looking um, at um, recent opinion polls um, in the United States, and they make interesting uh, uh, reading. Um, so if you take, uh, for example, uh, this straightforward question, do you approve of Israel's uh, reaction uh, to um, uh, October the 7th? Well, in November, 50% of Americans polled uh, said, yes, they approve. But... Uh, if we take what they say now, uh, that approval rating has gone down uh, to 36 uh, percent. If we take those who actually disapprove, that's gone up from 45 percent to 55 uh, percent. So Biden faces a danger uh, that from amongst those uh, uh, people, um, they will opt uh, for an independent candidate, for a third party candidate, or simply uh, put two fingers up uh, and abstain. Uh, they are unlikely uh, to go for Trump and the Republicans. That's obvious. Uh, but there's a distinct possibility uh, that what uh, these people will conclude um, is that um, Biden might be the lesser of two evils, uh, but Biden remains an evil and that um, uh, he doesn't uh, deserve any support. And of course, if we look at uh, the polls um, comparing Biden and Trump, in spite of, or you could say because of uh, Trump's uh, legal uh, problems, the persecution uh, that uh, Democrat uh, uh, authorities have unleashed on him, Trump is actually ahead. And my understanding is because of the the state system and the system of delegates uh, that uh, go to elect uh, a president, a Democrat would have to be actually in front um, of uh, their Republican cha challenger, not behind uh, their Republican uh, cha challenger. So Biden is under pressure. Biden is under pressure uh, both because of strategic uh, considerations in terms of the United States uh, and its allies, its Arab Muslim uh, allies in the Middle East, but also he's under pressure uh, domestically in what is a presidential uh, election uh, year. Okay, yesterday um, I and a small team of comrades were on the 11th uh, national uh, demonstration in solidarity with Palestine and the Gazan population in London. Uh, the organizers report 200,000 uh, people uh, attended. I've got no ability. I wasn't uh, trying to count 
or anything along those lines. Um, I'm simply um, using the 200,000 uh, figure to contrast it with other demonstrations uh, that have had uh, reports of 800,000 people turning up, 400,000 uh, people turning up. Um, I should emphasize that in Britain, um, Easter um, is a big holiday, um, not because um, Britain is particularly a religious uh, uh, country for most uh, um, uh, of its population. Um, it isn't. On the other hand, it's a big holiday, get away. Uh, um, and so, you know, the headlines have been full of um, snarled up motorways, uh, railways not running, the channel crossings being delayed by seven hours because of uh, uh, the weather. But also, of course, as I've uh, already mentioned uh, earlier, um, it's also Ramadan, and I don't know how much that has affected uh, the Muslim turnout uh, on these demonstrations. From my observation, uh, there was still a very strong Muslim uh, turnout, uh, but the demonstrations um, um, on this question are a very mixed uh, affair, you know, a good fair cross-section um, of the London population and beyond. So I think because of that, I don't take it at all uh, that there's been a downturn uh, in anger, a downturn um, in people's uh, willingness to demonstrate. Uh, I don't detect um, some sort of fatigue um, uh, setting in, far from it. Uh, the demonstrations remain militant. Uh, and I think in terms of the British population, it's going the same way, except it's starting from a higher level uh, than we've seen in the United States. In other words, public opinion is becoming more and more uh, sympathetic uh, to the Palestinians and more and more hostile and less sympathetic uh, 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 to, to Israel. And therefore we have, just like uh, in the United States, a huge gulf between where the majority of the actual population is and where the so-called political class uh, uh, is. So it's true uh, that Keir Starmer, having loyally followed uh, um, Joe Biden and the United States when it came to not calling uh, for a ceasefire, um, you know, has uh, um, bowed uh, to his uh, master in Washington in a display of absolute, um, how should I put it, poodledom, um, that, you know, he's not Jeremy Corbyn, that he's the most reliable ally one could possibly uh, think of. Um, he's moved, but he's only moved as far as Joe Biden uh, has moved. So, yes, there are, how should I put it, um, moves afoot um, when it comes to our uh, general election, which we all presume will be held sometime uh, this year, though it's technically possible uh, to delay it to January 2025, chances are that won't happen. Uh, so there's lots of talk and lots of moves to stand independent candidates here, there, and a whole number of different places. There's talk of some sort of, um, I don't know, green, um, socialistic, broad left, popular frontist, who knows what, after uh, the general uh, election. Uh, nonetheless, as things look at the moment, while it might be touch and go when it comes to Joe Biden, um, I don't think that that's the case with the Labour Party and uh, the prospects of Keir Starmer uh, entering number 10 in 2024. Uh, the Labour Party is still, you know, miles ahead uh, in the polls compared with the Tories. And if uh, they stick to their word, uh, the Tories are challenged from their right uh, by uh, Reform UK, uh, which is basically uh, the former Brexit party, which of date has got one MP uh, due to the defection of Lee Anderson, the former vice chair um, of uh, the Tory party. OK, just one. You're going to have to forgive my um, Persian uh, now. Uh, we've had... Uh, I wouldn't call it an attempt on his life, but we've had the stabbing of uh, one uh, Paria 
Satai. Um, anyway, he's an employee of um, Iran International. Uh, this is a TV station which has nothing to do with Iran, except Iran uh, is its target uh, audience. This is a TV station that used to be either owned or owned and controlled um, uh, by the um, Saudis. Uh, my understanding is at the moment, given the Saudi Iranian rapprochement, uh, this TV station was offloaded as part of that agreement. And today it's effectively uh, the mouthpiece of Mossad, uh, the Israeli uh, intelligence uh, uh, service. Um, now, I have never watched uh, this program. Uh, I am told that it's rubbish. I mean, I wouldn't understand it, would I? Uh, but I am told uh, that it's rubbish, uh, even though it's uh, watched. I don't know how widely um, um, in, in Iran. Um, but it's not inconceivable um, that uh, this wasn't uh, the action um, of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, reports of the stabbing, uh, quite clearly, um, you know, this wasn't a, um, um, an assassination attempt because the, the guy is there uh, with his two fingers uh, up in the air, victory, uh, not badly um, injured. I wouldn't say it was a scratch, uh, but this wasn't a life-threatening attack. And one would have thought that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was either directly or indirectly uh, involved, the instruction wouldn't be, well, go out and scratch this guy. Uh, presumably the instruction would go out and say, kill uh, this um, individual. Look, I don't know, uh, but I'm simply saying uh, that we shouldn't automatically assume uh, that this was a direct Iranian operation. It could be precisely uh, because this is a mouthpiece of Israeli uh, propaganda, uh, people who are outraged against Israel because of Gaza, uh, that this attack uh, took place. So I'm speculating, I know that, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is worthwhile uh, uh, saying. And of course, in Gaza at the present time, what we have um, is the UN officially announcing what we all expected, and that is the first signs of uh, famine. And we need to stress that famine isn't the same as hunger. Uh, what we're talking about isn't you know, a little bit of uh, loss of body fat. Uh, what we're talking about is a situation where the human body is so deprived of um, um, you know, nutritionist food uh, that it becomes vulnerable uh, to death through disease. Usually it's not that people die of hunger. Uh, what happens is that the body uh, becomes vulnerable uh, to anything, you know, um, the common cold, uh, diarrhea, um, certainly amongst children, but then amongst adults, um, uh, you know, th these things become uh, killers. And we would suddenly, if, if that gri gr grips the, the population, which is what the UN is uh, telling us, suddenly the death toll uh, in Gaza uh, will zoom upwards. Uh, I mean, at the moment, it's a horrendous uh, number of deaths. You know, I mean, we don't know, do we? The official figure, you know, from Hamas, and I see no reason uh, to doubt it, 32,000. That, I presume, excludes people, you know, under rubble. Um, but we would expect with famine uh, numbers, not just to double, not just to treble, uh, but to shoot upwards um, into the hundred thousand uh, very quickly uh, and beyond. And I have to say that the BBC, I presume this is a journalist seeing what they can get away with, as opposed to you know, the editorial decisions of the BBC. We had a very good report on um, BBC Radio from a, a journalist. I don't know her name, but she was making the point that uh, US um, air deliveries uh, that Biden is making much of, you know, a one, a drop in the ocean uh, compared with what is needed. And also, you know, the reports that we're getting um, indicate how hungry people are 
uh, because people have been reported to have drowned uh, in the attempt to uh, get um, th these airdrops, you know, um, that have accidentally gone into the sea. Uh, we've also got reports of people, you know, being trampled uh, uh, underfoot uh, when there's one of these parachutes uh, come down, leave aside, um, you know, deaths from when the parachute hasn't opened. But the important thing really is that this is gesture politics, just like uh, the UN abstention uh, was gesture uh, politics. It isn't the United States making a meaningful move uh, to stop what looks like uh, will be death on a monumental scale, especially when we consider how few people, relatively speaking, uh, actually live uh, in Gaza. I mean, already, as comrades have pointed out, on many occasions, you know, per head, uh, the death toll in Gaza has been bigger uh, than when it comes to German cities uh, that were um, carpet bombed uh, during uh, World War II by the RAF and the United States um, Air Force. OK, moving on, um, I thought I would comment on the resignation of Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Who's Sir Geoffrey Donaldson? Well, he was uh, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, the biggest Unionist Party uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, this is what the police say. This refers to um, allegations of a sexual nature uh, that are historic. Um, I've been told um, what the allegations are and from who. I'm not going to repeat um, um, it here. Suffice to say, his resignation has been accepted. We've got his deputy uh, in. And the important thing here um, is that um, we should expect a challenger. Um, because what we have in the DUP is a dissident wing, uh, a dissident wing uh, that thinks that Sir Geoffrey went soft uh, when it came to uh, power sharing. Um, being put uh, back on track, um, soft when it came to the deal uh, that allowed uh, power sharing, uh, and of course deep dissatisfaction uh, that power sharing went hand in hand, at least with this symbolic uh, division between uh, the first minister and the deputy, uh, with the first minister for the first time uh, being a member of Sinn Féin, uh, which today is Northern Ireland's biggest party, as opposed to biggest unionist uh, uh, party. Um, so what does the future um, hold? My prediction for what it's worth is I think we will see the continuation of the disintegration of what used to be called in my um, uh, youth, uh, the unionist monolith. Here was a party uh, that was formed um, as the outcome of um, liberal and Tory opposition uh, to Gladstone and the mainstream Liberal Party uh, and its advocacy of home rule of one sort or another uh, for Ireland. Uh, this not only produced a movement amongst unionists mainly Protestants in Northern Ireland, uh, but also um, Unionists in Southern Ireland. So for example, um, Carson, uh, the leader, um, I think the longest leader of the um, uh, Unionist uh, party, he was actually based not in Belfast or uh, what um, uh, Unionists call uh, London, uh, Derry, but actually based uh, in Dublin. But the important point to remember here is that what we were dealing with, as I said, is something beyond uh, Ireland, and we were dealing with British politics, the split in the Liberal Party uh, between Liberal Unionists, um, as well as uh, the fear of um, uh, um, Unionists in Ireland uh, that Home Rule will lead 
uh, to the end of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland uh, as it was. Uh, well, uh, we didn't have home rule, uh, but we did have the end of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And we had um, quasi independence uh, of the South, uh, the so-called free state. And we had the creation out of uh, the historic uh, nine counties of Ulster. We had the creation of the six county Northern Ireland statelet that was run uninterruptedly uh, by the um, Unionist Party, I think until 1972 when direct rule uh, was imposed from uh, London. And th this, this um, Unionist Party in Northern Ireland was led, I think, with one exception um, by prime ministers who were either from the landed aristocracy or from the industrial capitalist uh, uh, class. But that's what it represented. It was a um, patrician party, but yeah, that had a mass base not least uh, through the orange um, or order. And of course the, um, the Ulster Unionist Party uh, was fundamentally broken, um, first of all, by opposition amongst the Catholic nationalist uh, population, first of all, in the form of the civil rights movement, and then that developing into an armed struggle. Um, they had the, um, uh, uh, putting of the British army onto the streets of um, um, uh, Northern Ireland. But also what we had is British attempts uh, to come to a deal with, first of all, constitutional uh, nationalists in the North, but also running hand in hand with that, often not publicized, attempts to do a deal uh, with Sinn Féin stroke IRA. And it was precisely a combination of these two things uh, that saw um, Ulster Unionism go from being a monolith uh, to splinter, splinter, splinter. It produced many uh, different uh, divisions, but the most important uh, division uh, was the DUP, the Democratic uh, Unionist Party, originally founded and led uh, by Ian Paisley. And what characterised unionism from its beginning, but above all in the form of um, uh, Paisley, but we can see the continuation of it was basically uh, the slogan, Ulster says no. I can still sort of hear in my brain, Ian Paisley didn't need amplification, you know, his booming voice, Ulster says no, no, no. And whatever it was, Ulster said no. But of course, what we saw um, is figures such as Paisley, brought on board by the uh, British, and then a new generation of Ulster says no um, oppositions inside uh, one party or another. Um, hence the defection of uh, Geoffrey Donaldson from the official, what I'll call the official Unionist Party to the DUP, but also, as I said, uh, the growing dissatisfaction with his leadership, but also uh, the formation of the, I've got to get it right, uh, the uh, traditional unionist voice. I think that's correct. Or is it traditional Ulster voice? I think it's traditional unionist uh, voice, which is the party to the right uh, of uh, the DUP. So I would expect myself uh, to see uh, unionism uh, to continue to splinter. This isn't simply about um, uh, one individual um, and his particular uh, legal troubles. Uh, this is about something uh, bigger that goes to the very nature uh, of Northern Ireland itself and shows you uh, that whatever stability that people might have thought uh, this statelet had, um, you know, in the 20s and 30s, um, that was illusory, uh, that this statelet was founded um, on the basis of being a Protestant state for a Protestant people. The problem was uh, that the way they drew uh, the border was deliberately as big as possible, and it included a very substantial Catholic minority that was systematically discriminated against 
when it came to jobs, when it came to housing, when it came to voting. And now we have uh, a situation because of demographics um, of where it's Sinn Féin, not the Social Democratic Labour Party, um, um, uh, as they were expecting uh, uh, to dominate the um, Stormont Assembly uh, and power sharing. No, we have Sinn Féin. But again, just to make the point uh, that with Sinn Féin and um, uh, its leadership, what they're promising, and it shows you the change with, the, with Sinn Féin, is that they're promising that this scandal will not affect, will not upset uh, power sharing, uh, that they want the stability um, of uh, the state. So that's, that's a shift um, with Sinn Féin. Uh, what exactly happens in terms of the general election in the South uh, that has to occur um, by March 2025 is an open question, except to say, of course, uh, that Sinn Féin isn't only the biggest party in Northern Ireland, it's the biggest party in Southern Ireland um, uh, as well. So there's a real prospect of um, Sinn Féin government North and South. And my expectation would be uh, that uh, uh, if Westminster was to allow a border poll, uh, which is under the provisions of the Good Friday deal, this would have to be with the uh, consent of the United States, whether it's Trump or Biden. Um, I don't think it matters whether, you know, Biden considers himself, you know, Irish or anything, stuff like that. But I would expect Sinn Féin at least uh, to be open to, if not pressurized into agreeing to Irish membership of NATO, uh, for example, as a quid pro quo, um, uh, even when it came to a poll, the result of which is by no means uh, certain. OK, so enough of that. So I, I'm, I could go on more about uh, Northern Ireland, but I'm not going to. Just a, a quick comment on Ukraine. We've had uh, Donald Tusk of uh, Poland talk about war in Europe as a real threat, quote, unquote. And he's also talked about 1939 and all of that. So we live apparently in conditions that are analogous uh, to 19. 39. I have to say that bourgeois politicians of the present generation uh, are remarkable uh, in their ability not to think beyond World War II. World War II is the, the moment that hangs over them. This is the analogy they instantly draw for, for anything, it seems. So, you know, Gaddafi in Libya was Adolf Hitler. Saddam Hussein was Hitler. <coughs> Gamal uh, Nasser in Egypt in 1956 was Hitler. You know, the list continues. Uh, but if you wanted to draw an analogy, and all analogies have their severe limits, so uh, they might uh, cast some sort of light on current events by thinking about the past. That has cer a certain use. If I was going to draw an analogy, it wouldn't be with World War II. It would actually be World War I. And that is true both in terms of the politics uh, and it's also true uh, with the battlefield, at least when it comes uh, to Ukraine. Uh, because what we've seen, yes, with the addition of drones, uh, with the addition of uh, guided uh, missiles, with the addition of, um, you know, shoulder launched anti-tank missiles, we've basically seen um, um, battles um, and a strategy uh, that's remarkably similar to at least the Western Front um, from 1914 uh, to 1918. Uh, but I think that in order to discuss the possibility of war in Europe, uh, what we need to do is actually put what's going on in Ukraine in the bigger picture. In other words, if we look at World War I and only see Serbia, plucky little Serbia, or brave little Belgium, uh, we actually miss what the war was all about. So in World War I, to me, uh, the war is about who's going to be the global hegemon. Is it going to be the United Kingdom? Does the United Kingdom and the British Empire continue to dominate the world? Or is it the rising power of Germany 
uh, that's going to rise and challenge and overthrow British hegemony. Well, the British were determined uh, to knock Germany out. Um, Germany wasn't in the position of directly challenging a British hegemony, but it was the, the most serious challenger. I'll leave the United States uh, aside. But today, the only serious challenger uh, to US hegemony uh, is China. It's way, way behind uh, the United States, uh, not just the United States as a country in terms of GDP, productivity per head, technology, uh, leading companies, but the United States precisely as the global hegemon uh, dominates Europe. The United States dominates Japan, South Korea. Uh, the United States you know, has uh, armed forces um, way beyond uh, the capability uh, of um, China directly, let alone when we include its uh, allies. And of course, what the United States has achieved uh, with the Ukraine war um, is further European dependence um, on the United States when it comes to power. So when it comes to oil and gas, it's no longer um, gas from Siberia. Uh, that's coming over uh, um, to um, power uh, German industries or French uh, industries. It's now American or Middle Eastern gas and oil, which is controlled um, by the United States. So the United States has successfully um, kept Europe divided, kept Europe dependent. And clearly in terms of its war, why it's had perhaps the calculated um, side effect of um, forcing Russia into the arms of Ch China, forcing um, Russia to become the equivalent of uh, Austria-Hungary in World War I or in the run-up uh, to World War I. Nonetheless, I, I myself would see what's going on in Ukraine in that sort of context. So it's not simply a question of, it was Putin who attacked first in February back there, uh, two years uh, ago, um, it's not the it's not a question of um, oh well uh, it was Russia that sponsored you know these breakaway republics it was Russia uh, that annexed uh, uh, Crimea we need to look at it in the bigger picture if you don't look at it in the bigger picture uh, then you end up actually seeing nothing uh, which of course is the case with the social uh, imperialist left who cannot see the difference. They say at the moment uh, between Palestine, which is occupied, and eastern Ukraine, uh, which is occupied. It's just um, facile. Uh, that isn't Marxist politics. It's uh, school schoolyard uh, 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 politics. OK, so in terms of the actual military situation, what are we told? Well, we know uh, that Ukraine at the moment um, is in real difficulty. There's no hiding uh, uh, that. That doesn't mean, I think, uh, that Ukraine is just about to uh, collapse, that we are... seeing the beginning of the end of Ukrainian resistance. But nonetheless, uh, if we look at um, the statistics, uh, they speak very loudly. And at the moment, the statistics tell us if we're to trust the statistics, and I, I don't really see any particular reason to doubt them, but if comrades want to throw doubt on it, I'm open to persuasion. But what we're told is that daily uh, Russia uh, is uh, firing off 10,000 artillery rounds. Um, artillery is vital um, in this war. Artillery gains you territory and artillery keeps you uh, uh, territory. Um, you ain't gonna um, advance your infantry in order to capture territory. Um, um, that is simply sending uh, your uh, men into the jaws of death. First of all, what you've got to do is pound uh, the other side and to hold any ground uh, that you gain, uh, you've got to bring up artillery uh, that again are pounding uh, your enemy. So artillery remains central uh, to this war. So it's a ratio of five to one, 10,000 Russian uh, rounds of artillery shells, 2,000 
uh, Ukrainian shells. Meanwhile, Europe is promising uh, to up its uh, production of artillery shells to a million a year. And the United States, which is not able to supply uh, Ukraine uh, because it hasn't been agreed by Congress, as, as opposed to those previous deals with Israel uh, that I mentioned, uh, is upping its capability to 1.6 million um, shells a year, which is something at least in the sort of order uh, of what Russia uh, is producing. I'm leaving aside, you know, North Korea and its supplies uh, and all the rest of it. Nonetheless, um, uh, that tells us something. And of course, what's been happening in winter is that uh, Russia has been making, I would call them tactical gains. OK, uh, you know, a town here, uh, but mainly uh, it's small bits of uh, territory, no strategic uh, uh, breakthrough. Uh, but there is talk um, of uh, a Russian spring offensive. Uh, I take that with as much pinch of salt as I took talk of um, a Ukrainian spring offensive. I have been reading really silly articles in the British press. Um, you know, I can imagine some armchair general looking out their window at their garden and going, ah, um, winter's over, spring is here, uh, the garden is drying out. And uh, they imagine uh, that that's what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, as we've pointed out, that if you take frozen ground, that isn't something that generals fear, um, you know, in the Russian-Ukrainian um, theatre of war. Um, your tanks can run over them, lorries uh, can run, uh, lorries therefore can deliver those shells, that, that food that the troops need. It can deliver uh, the fuel that the tanks uh, uh, need and all the rest of it. Uh, but when it comes to autumn, when it comes to spring, uh, what you get in that theater of war is mud. And if you want to look at pictures, it's really worthwhile looking at. We're not talking about a little bit of mud where you need to wear welly boots. Uh, what we're talking about is mud uh, up to your knees and beyond. And indeed, I've been reading um, disparaging reports of uh, the performance of the much vaunted Challenger 2 British tanks uh, supplied to Ukraine, because apparently not only are they not sufficiently armored to withstand uh, Russian attack, uh, but they're so heavy uh, and so um, uh, underpowered when it comes to their engines that they get stuck in mud and have to be towed out either by special vehicles or by other tanks. Meanwhile, of course, um, Russia uh, sees a sitting target um, um, and pounds in uh, with artillery uh, round after round after uh, round. But the point I'm making um, here is that we shouldn't, at least from my angle, uh, be expecting a spring offensive uh, from Russia. If there is going to be an offensive, it will be very late spring. I can remember writing my article uh, when the um, Ukrainian offensive began, I drafted it and was basically going, look, where's the spring offensive? This was one week before the end of uh, spring, officially. Uh, and then the damn thing started and I had to rewrite uh, the, uh, the at least the beginning um, of the article. Uh, but the point was still there. Uh, you don't launch. Uh, an offensive in autumn. You don't launch an offensive in spring. Winter, yes. Summer, yes. And that brings me to the possibility, um, and I say it no stronger than that, at least the possibility of something more than tactical uh, advance uh, by Russia, because I didn't know this uh, in terms of my previous writings um, on uh, Ukraine, um, because back in November, um, Zelensky had issued instructions. This is after the failure of the um, summer offensive uh, for Ukraine to dig, dig, dig. And remember, he'd previously been um, promising his Western uh, military advisors and suppliers, the politicians, the population, uh, that Ukraine was just about to go on an offensive and sweep away uh, Russia from the south and Russia 
uh, in the West. Um, it didn't happen. And indeed, uh, they made, to all intents and purposes, no advances whatsoever. Why? Because Russia had been digging, digging, digging and uh, putting in place wide tank traps, um, fearsome um, uh, minefields, um, and then putting in place these things called dragon's teeth, you know, these uh, pyramid shaped concrete uh, blocks that stop tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers advancing. And then behind that, you had three lines of trenches supported by uh, defensive artillery uh, position. Leave aside uh, the Air Force, leave aside uh, um, um, uh, other uh, aspects of war. And that's what stopped the um, Ukrainian advance. So in November, Zelensky issues orders uh, to put in place uh, an equivalent um, Ukrainian uh, line um, of uh, defenses. Remember, this is going to have to go if it's going to work, not only along the entire front line, all along the Russian border. And I would very much suggest all the way over the border with Belarus. Uh, otherwise, the Russian army just does uh, what the German army did in World War I on World War II, just go round, go round the line of defence. Either way, I didn't know it until I've been reading recently, uh, that Ukraine really only began that work seriously in the beginning of March, March. So they've only been doing it for a month. Is that going to be enough to uh, dig, dig, dig uh, over a thousand mile of defences to put in place, you know, deep um, minefields, tank traps, dragon's teeth, and then line after line uh, of trenches. Um, I doubt it. And therefore, yes, Ukraine, if it's gone, as it has done from the idea of an offensive war to what they're calling a tactically defensive war or a defensive war uh, that involves taking tactical advantage of Russian weaknesses, uh, Ukraine is vulnerable. And I think that's what Tusk is talking about. That's what Macron uh, is talking about. And just a final note um, on Ukraine. I would be very cautious in saying that um, Trump will bring peace in Ukraine. Uh, he might say he could solve the Ukraine uh, war. With, what did he say? In 24 hours? That might be true. Um, that there you are, Vladimir, I like you so much. Um, you can have the East and you can even have a bit of the South. You can certainly keep uh, Crimea. Is Trump going to say that? Maybe. Um, or is Trump actually um, propelled by the strategic imperatives that I uh, began uh, this particular section with, i.e. Um, overcoming the challenge uh, represented uh, by China? I would actually say precisely given the Ukraine war and what's happened economically, binding China and Russia ever closer uh, uh, together, uh, that... Uh, it's unlikely uh, that we'll simply see um, the outbreak of peace in January uh, if, and it's still a big if, uh, we have Trump swearing um, on the Bible in January uh, 2025. Okay, just lastly, in my last four minutes, and I am going to be have to be brief because I don't like going over uh, the hour, I just thought I'd reply very briefly here. Maybe some other comrades would like to take up the challenge uh, in terms of writing a letter to the Weekly Worker. Uh, the letter from Steri Wicklar, I don't know how you pronounce uh, the name, so apologies to the comrade. He's a member of the Socialists in uh, the Netherlands. This is the regroupment on the left after the um, right uh, turn by the Socialist Party uh, in the Netherlands, the turned towards coalitionism uh, by the former Maoist leadership. Uh, we've got this uh, regroupment going on and the comrade is part of something called the left flank. I don't know uh, what its um, history is. I don't know what its origins is. Either way, he's saying, I take the minimum maximum program seriously, which is good. Um, you know, we see the outbreak of 
what I'll call common sense, no insult. Uh, I'm taking that as a, uh, I'm using that word as a, a compliment. But what he says, and I don't know whether there's something lost in translation here, um, is that uh, uh, our minimum program or our program is far too detailed. Um, I accept uh, that he's right, uh, that when you compare our draft program, you know, with the program of Russian social democracy, or for that matter, the Russian Communist Party, uh, the Earth Thought program um, of German social democracy and the equivalent programs of the Workers' Party in France, the Austrian Party, et cetera, et cetera. Our one is an awful lot longer, and that's certainly true. But the difference is, comrade, uh, that these, these, these parties... Uh, didn't carry the burden of history with them. And we do. We have the heavy history of the 20th century and the failure uh, of official communism, uh, the failure of the Russian revolution to spread, the failure uh, of uh, social democracy to deliver anything um, other than a tinkered capitalism. And then nowadays, absolutely nothing except an austerity neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism, we carry that burden. And I think we are obliged, if we want to appeal uh, to the working class, if we want to motivate the working class, to at least in outline um, show uh, that what we have in mind is something radically different uh, to the past um, in terms of the failures uh, of the past. Uh, as I said, I think something might be lost in translation uh, because uh, the comrade picks out in particular the phrase where appropriate when it comes to housing. Just wanted to emphasize that, you know, if we look at Britain, if we look at uh, London, um, there's a housing crisis. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, in terms of London, um, renters uh, are now spending between a third and a half their entire income. Um, on housing. I'm from the generation um, where the Tories used to boast about council housing. Um, that more or less doesn't exist now. You have, um, how should you put it, housing associations, uh, but also what you have is a shift uh, to private ownership and um, rentier um, accommodation. And the point would be that if you take what the average family or what the average individual lives in now, they are, it is massively smaller and it's getting smaller and smaller and more and more expensive. And what we're putting forward is the idea um, that instead of having, for example, Soviet style blocks of flats, or for that matter, uh, the sort of blocks of flats that we were used to in Britain, remember highly urbanized society, perhaps as the only um, comparative society, perhaps, I don't know, I would have thought uh, in terms of Europe would be the Netherlands. Um, either way, yet yeah, we want a vision of where people who live somewhere are also responsible for running where they live, but also designing, um, you know, where they live. That's what the bourgeoisie do. That's what the middle classes do. Um, we're thinking not so much of the sort of council housing uh, that the militant council, so-called militant council of Liverpool, uh, delivered, you know, under Derek Hatton, uh, we're thinking much more along the lines of Karl Marx Hoff, Karl Marx Hoff uh, in Vienna, in Red Vienna, uh, which not only, you know, had kitchens, communal kitchens, uh, but had a communal uh, workers' defence guard uh, as well. That's our vision of the future. And the comrade puts forward the idea uh, that things shouldn't be long and sweet for the bourgeoisie, sweet for the bourgeoisie. They should be short and bitter for the bourgeoisie. I profoundly disagree with that. Um, we include in our draft programme um, the slogan which we took uh, from the physical force wing, the left wing of the Chartist movement um, that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were inspired by and supported. Peacefully, if we can, forcibly if we must. And Marx, for example, I think um, in the only meeting of the international that he attended, which was in The Hague in the Netherlands, spoke about the possibility of a peaceful transformation in Britain 
and in the Netherlands. And he said, I don't know much about the Netherlands, but in Britain, it's possible. And what we could do is bribe the bourgeoisie. Now, I don't know whether that's possible um, in the 19th century, or whether it's possible in the 21st. But we want actually a situation of where, yeah, uh, we get the bourgeoisie split uh, when it comes to the working class coming uh, to power. We want to minimize uh, the ability of the bourgeoisie to resist. And that isn't by making things bitter and hard to swallow uh, for the bourgeoisie, uh, but precisely saying that there are options um, uh, of where we can make things humane for you. We're not out for revenge. We're not out uh, to shoot people. We will resist if you launch a slave owner's rebellion. Uh, yes, we will. We will shoot people if we have to. Uh, but the emphasis is on the have to. So I think the, the comrade, as I said, gets confused when it comes to the phrase where appropriate, because what he picks out when it comes to housing, we're putting forward this uh, vision of people designing, gets, I think, uh, confused when it comes to this phrase where appropriate, because we advocate uh, play areas. But what I've got in mind and what the comrades have in mind, for example, uh, is if you take accommodation that's devoted uh, to uh, elderly people, it might not be appropriate to have a play area uh, directly outside their windows. After all, maybe there's no children there. But when it comes to ordinary flats that cater uh, for the full range of the population, yeah, we want play areas. Um, something when I was a kid, we had. Something now, in terms of present housing, you do not have. Uh, kids now don't play together. Um, they're isolated indoors. They get together at school, uh, but not when it comes, you know, to playing in the street. There's nowhere to play in the street. It's too dangerous. There's no play areas. I think that's a good thing to have in a draft program. So, yeah, we have the burden of history, but we also, I think, have an obligation to explain to people to make it as clear as possible without going into too much detail. That's certainly a temptation. Um, that things will be different this time round. Uh, I should also add that the comrade uses the phrase about our draft program, that it drags on for 64 pages. Well, I would simply say, I don't know what the actual measurement of uh, the page of our draft program is, except to say that it's smaller uh, than a sheet of A4 paper folded. So it's A5 and smaller, and that includes our draft rules as well as an introduction. Um, so we are, we are very conscious um, of the danger of the program getting bigger and bigger. We're very conscious uh, that this draft program should last um, theoretically until the moment of revolution itself. Um, yes, we are aware of that. Nonetheless, we, we don't apologize uh, for the length of it. Uh, but we take the Conway's criticisms as serious uh, and we take them as helpful uh, in spite of either a failure in to perhaps uh, in terms of translation uh, and maybe um, uh, a failure when it comes to actually understand what we're specifically referring to when we use the phrase where appropriate. We don't think it's appropriate uh, to follow what the Conway says. Well, maybe we build um, you know, wooden huts uh, for the proletariat. We don't think that, that should appear in the programme. Um, no, we want houses fit for the ruling class, i.e. the working class. That's the sort of accommodation that the working class should aspire for and be willing to fight for. That's it. Thank you, Bob.